My name is Bill Morrison. I'm a filmmaker um, showing these films here in an exhibit called Time to Time at the Art Gallery of South Australia. Um, my interest is primarily in archival footage, um, footage that has been stored in archives over the years and in some cases it's begun to rot and um, I'm really interested in how the materiality of the film can be edited and uh, braided into different stories about um, decomposition or, uh, in, other in other words, trying to find different ways of looking at the footage through its materiality. I started out as a painter, and um, as a painter was, of course, interested in the surface and the plasticity of the, the canvas. Um, as I started to uh, make films, I was interested in having a uh, a captive audience, as it were. Um, with a painting, you can look at a, a painting for an uh, undetermined amount of time. With a film, it's a set amount of time, and you control the circumstances with the soundtrack and a darkened room. Um, so it set up a new relationship with the viewer, and uh, a relationship that I found was augmented when you referred again to the plasticity of the film. Uh, because instead of being a space that the viewer just entered into, it was also uh, the awareness that you were looking at something that had been stored in time in the physical world. Uh, so you were at once seduced by that space and at the same time repelled by that surface. And I thought that that was an interesting uh, headspace for the viewer to be in. Yeah, Outer Borough, um, I believe is the oldest clip that I've worked with. It's from a, uh, a newsreel footage called Across the Brooklyn Bridge that was originally shot in the now defunct 68 millimeter film gauge. And uh, in 1899, it shows a trip across the Brooklyn Bridge from Manhattan to Brooklyn. Uh, it was restored by the British Film Institute uh, a few years ago, I think in 2004, 2005. Uh, and I saw it a, at a film conference, the Orphan Film Symposium, and really fell, fell in love with that one trip across the, the bridge. Um, I negotiated to get the rights to it and to use it and uh, recreated it as this split screen uh, exposition that you see here where you're going to Brooklyn and to Manhattan at the same time. A release is similarly constructed in a diptych um, split screen two four by three uh, formatted films um, in a in a widescreen 16 by 9 format, and uh, um, this was a remarkable piece of footage. Um, I was commissioned by the um, a Philadelphia Museum and uh, to create a a film that would be in a cell next to uh, Al Capone's cell. Um, it was a Eastern State Penitentiary which Al Capone had um, served time in for about nine months in uh, between 1929 and 1930. Um, while I was doing research for this project, I found a piece of footage that the uh, penitentiary themselves didn't know existed. It was a new piece of footage for them. Um, and it showed the day of uh, Capone's supposed release where it was announced that Al Capone would be released from this penitentiary and taken back to Chicago. Um, the warden actually released uh, Capone the night before, but he didn't tell the newspapers. And uh, what you see here is a uh, crowd gathering on uh, the street outside of, uh, of the penitentiary, school children, um, all types of people, uh, black, white, rich, poor, uh, women, men, girls, boys and a newsreel team. Um, and it's a single pan. The shot starts uh, looking down the street and then uh, it sweeps around and it shows the penitentiary door and then there's a pause and a piece of paper falls down and then the door opens and out watch, walks someone with sort of the same build as Al Capone and wearing a fedora and the cameras rush at him and then they realize that it's not him, it's somebody else. Um, it was an incredible moment of anticipation, uh, a beautiful uh, studied camera move down the street showing all these faces 
and then this moment of uh, recognition and then disappointment. Um, it was a moment that I wanted to sustain and also build up the same kind of excitement. What, who was going to walk through that door? Would it be Capone? Um, and so we took uh, what I believe is a minute and changed the shot and uh, started it in the middle and then expanded it, the head and the tail um, so that you're seeing a little bit more of it uh, until you're seeing the final shot is uh, at the very end. Uh, the film behind me now is The Creature's Education, which is uh, a chapter from a larger work called The Spark of Being. Um, Spark of Being was a retelling of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein using archival footage uh, to tell the story. Um, and in A Creature's Education, it's, uh, the creature is hovering near a family and he's learning uh, the history and culture of the world um, through uh, a bunch of lessons that are being given to uh, the family. Um, so, uh, as with the rest of the film, it's being told with little clips from uh, resourced archival films, and in this case it's educational films as it's his education. So, um, uh, this particular collection were, were a bunch of 16 millimeter films that had been uh, found in, well, they are held by a, uh, a collector in North Carolina and his collection had been immersed in a flood and uh, he needed to throw away all the films that had stuck together where the base and the emulsion had stuck together and uh, in unwinding them they had taken a little bit off. Um, so uh, I asked him if he could give me any of the films that he was going to throw away that had been destroyed that way. And uh, he said that helped him actually uh, uh, troll through the collection and, and take out the trash, as it were. Uh, Skip Elsheimer, he runs a collection called AV Geeks in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, so I went through uh, all those films and, and took just the parts that where, the, where it unspooled and the emulsion stuck to the base and creates this beautiful, colorful explosion. So um, you're not seeing me distressing here. This is all. Uh, natural uh, distress to the to the emulsion. Uh, the beautiful soundtrack, which you can't hear, uh, was composed by uh, Dave Douglas, and this was a again a, a feature-length project that Dave and I undertook under the uh, commission of Stanford University in 2010. Um, Lightest Calling is one of the uh, more remarkable examples of nitrate deterioration. Um, this was a case where I'd already made sort of my opus in Decasia and with the great assistance of a nitrate vault manager at the Library of Congress. And the next year he called me up and said, you know, I found this film uh, in our archive here and we have a, a pristine version of it and then we have this one where three of the rolls are, are, be, are falling apart and we're going to throw it away but I thought you'd want to see it before we did. So. I flew out from New York to uh, the middle of America to Dayton, Ohio, and um, that's where the vaults of the nitrate vaults of the Library of Congress were kept at, this, at that time. And, um, and he showed me this print. And what was remarkable about it is, uh, well, unlike what was happening with the 16 millimeter acetate that we saw in the creature's education, there was dissolution in the emulsion, but each r roll was able to unreal without pulling off the emulsion of the successive roll. So you have this beautiful um, ghost, ghostly uh, 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 deterioration where the emulsion is just kind of smudging uh, gradually and creating this dreamlike environment. Um, again, this isn't uh, my manipulation. This is what organically happens to these films when they're left on a shelf. Um, and in this case, they were left on a shelf in uh, cool, dry conditions, so there's really no accounting for it. Um, but at any rate, this one was a, uh, a feature film called The Bells. Uh, it featured Boris Karloff and uh, his first role in a film, and Lionel Barrymore was the star. And these were two uh, incidental characters, um, Barrymore's daughter and the future chief of police who meet on the road and fall in love. And this uh, original scene was a minute and 40. Um, I stretched each frame uh, four times and uh, in order to do that so that it didn't start becoming uh, incremental and 
appear like a slideshow. Um, we did two passes where uh, we blended uh, each frame with a, its subsequent frame so that you have a double exposure um, and, and that made it more fluid. Um, the soundtrack in this case is by Michael Gordon. Um, Michael was a longtime collaborator of mine and the composer of Decasia and he was releasing a new uh, CD on Nunsuch and he gave me the untitled CD and uh, 12 tracks on it um, before I took a trip across the country and I kept coming back to this track and uh, when I arrived at a residency in Wyoming I quickly edited this footage to that track and um, told Michael about it and he said well that track's called Light is Calling in fact it's the title track to the CD and so it stuck as the film's name as well. <laughs>